welcome back. It's Christine again with the Artist Pod. So uh, today I'm going to talk about color theory. Some of you may have heard me talking about color theory in the past. This is going to be very similar. But before we get started, I did want to talk about this lovely door behind me that a lot of people have been commenting on or asking about. Um, it's a door to a very magical land. Uh, sometimes they call it the Shire. Not much happens though. It's a, a pretty boring door. They don't seem to like adventures over there. Most exciting thing that happened were a group of four hobbits that went running through, screaming something about a ring in Mordor. So, all right, so let's get started with color theory. Okay, so with color theory, we're gonna start with the three primary colors, and that is red, yellow, and blue. And from these three colors, everything else can be made. So in theory, if you were a painter, for instance, you wouldn't need to buy any other color. You can make everything from these three with the absence of white, but, absent, but white is the absence of color, so you can't really make that. But you can make everything else with these. And then we have the secondary colors, uh, and the secondary colors are purple, orange, and green. So, you know, yellow and blue make green, blue and red make purple, and red and yellow make orange. So they're made from the primary colors. And with this, we complete a very basic color wheel. Now, you can go a little deeper. You can go to the tertiary colors and beyond. I've seen very complicated color wheels. I don't really think you need it. I think this is going to explain everything that you're going to need to know about how colors are interacting with each other. All right, so there are a lot of interactions happening here um, between the, the colors. So the first is going to be with the complement. So complementary colors are colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel. So, for instance, it's going to be uh, red and green, which we see all the time around Christmas, orange and blue, and yellow and purple. So there's several reasons why complementary colors work together. The first of which is that you're completing a basic color wheel within a complement. So you have, for instance, red, which is a, a primary color, and then you have green, which was made from yellow and blue, the other two primary colors. But one of the other reasons it works so well is you always have a warm color and a cool color within a complement. So warm colors and cool colors. Uh, warm colors are yellow, orange, and red. And they're colors that pop. They're in your face. They're going to push forward in the foreground. And they're a little bit more excitable. They're more passionate. They're more, they have that energy to them. And then cool colors are green, blue, and purple. And they're going to recede into the background they support warm colors very nicely from, from behind the scenes. They act very nicely as uh, darker colors or as shadowing. And so they, there's this play happening between warm and cool colors. So with complements, you know, you have, you have that interaction happening. You have a cool color that's supporting a warm color. You have sort of this relaxing, cool color that's receding backwards and this warm color that's pushing forward. But all complements really are doing is they're supporting each other they're, they're colors that make the other one pop. All right, so. All right, so I do want to talk about atmospheric perspective. So atmospheric perspective is a type of perspective that uses colors and color theory to sort of flesh it out. So we talked in another, another video about one point and two point perspective, and that really helps with boxes or architectural elements, cityscapes, things like that. But atmospheric perspective works very nicely with landscapes. So one of the reasons I like this photograph so much is it's got this nice ridge here that separates the warmer foreground from the cooler background. So with atmospheric perspective, you can kind of see even in this foreground, we have, even though green is, is a cooler color, it's a warmer green than what you're seeing in the background here, right? So it's got this, this warmth to it. And then the background sort of fades slowly into this blue. So the concept of atmospheric perspective is that you have warm colors in the foreground that fade to a bluer and hazier color the further away it gets. Now, the mountain back here, which is Mount Etna, was spewing smoke that day, so it was adding to the haziness, but even still, even if she wasn't, she'd be a little hazier, and things as, as they go away will just look bluer, and they'll look hazier the further away they get. Now, light has a, has a temperature to it, and you can kind of see it through here, too. You know, the, the light at different times of day, for instance. So sunlight in the morning is harsher than sunlight or, or warmer than sunlight in the uh, late evening, which is cooler. So all light has a temperature to it, and so do all shadows. But shadows are inherently cool, whereas light is inherently warm, even if it's cooler light. And so 
one of the things the Impressionists were doing, we're working with color theory, although I don't know that they knew that at the time, it was just something we've sort of figured out later that psychologically and, and realistically it, it absolutely works, and that is, you know, that, that they wouldn't paint with black, for instance. And black is an unnatural color, but blue is a fantastic shadower. Blue or purple, these colors, these cooler colors work very nicely to help shadow an image. But this is a great example of atmospheric perspective, and it's just the concept that things, even if they're cooler, even if it's a cool color like green, it's still warmer. It still has that little bit of yellowish green, and then as it goes further back, it gets bluer and bluer until you get to this very blue-looking mountain, um, and it gets that, that little bit of haze to it. But talking about blue as a shadower, so if we take this photograph here, and I were to come up and select the right image, helps when you're trying to do this, and go down to color balance, and then select shadows here, because it's, it's, it could, it's not a bad photograph, but it could be darker, and if I take that blue and I pop that blue on there, it really makes it dark, right? And it doesn't take much. I can come down here pretty quickly, darken this really far up. And I don't want to darken it too much, but you know the difference can be pretty astounding. And that's using blue. Blue is this, this really great shadowing color. But let's also take a look at a ball, right? So if I, if I have this orange ball here, all I've taken in this first image is I've taken the orange and I've made the orange darker, right? So that's how we get, we get this darker shadow basically around the ball. But what were to happen if I use blue instead of orange, right? I mean, blue's its complement, first of all, but it's also blue, so that might seem like it, a weird color to choose, but it works, right? We can see here the blue doesn't read as blue to us. Our minds, as I mentioned in, in the last video, our minds are incredible, and they do incredible things, and this is one of the examples of that. Our minds look at the blue as, it, as, it, as the ball sort of shadows into that, and we know it's a shadow. We don't think the ball's turning blue. We just know that's a shadow. And even though, if I were to, to ping this color, you can see the orange sits here, and then the blue sits kind of in the same spot. So even though both of these colors are in that same sort of tonal range, the blue appears darker. And that's sort of the effect of using uh, blue as a shadow, or blue or purple. I think blue's a little better though. Because you get, it darkens up a lot faster than using a lighter sort of warmer color is going to be able to darken up. And then you have the added benefit of having a warm color cooled with a uh, um, cool color that also is going to make it pop, and in this case you also have a complement. So all of that works together for us to look at this almost half and half, right? Like, I mean, we have orange here, but the, the shadow takes up a pretty significant amount of the, of the ball, and it still looks like it's an orange ball with a very, very dark shadow and a very extreme highlight here. All right, but we can look at that in a few other ways too. So we can see that in graphic design, right? So Mount Fuji is this light blue in the background, but even the white of the foreground, I've made the white in the warm spectrum. So even though sometimes these are subtle differences, it's enough that visually we pick up on it and, and we'll notice the difference and we'll see one pop or recede. And so this is a way that you can use that in graphic design. And I also have it with the dog here, the iris setter with the green on it. It's using the red and the green again as complements for each other, which helps make the colors pop, basically. They pop better with each other there. But if we're thinking about graphic design, right, you know, we talk sometimes about canvases, but if we're working with graphic design, even the color shirt we choose can be important because the shirt is effectively our canvas as graphic designers. Now, as you know, if you're if you're a painter or you're working with digital art, you can change that background. But a graphic designer, we have to worry about what color we're putting our images on. It's one of the reasons I design in black. Is anything that works in black will work with navy. 
because both of them are one, they're the two uh, most popular shirt colors for people to buy. So they're great colors to sort of think about as you're designing. But I designed on black because it will work with navy. And navy again pulls in that blue to really make a subject kind of pop if you need it to. And then the last thing I have for color theory here is this color wheel that I did, which is crazy, absolutely crazy. So it is a color wheel or color square. We have, um, you know, purple whose complement is yellow. So we have the, the yellow train tracks on top of the purple wedge. We have the orange birds on top of the blue wedge, the red bird and the train on top of the green wedge, the purple smoke and train on top of the yellow wedge, the blue house on the top of the trees on the orange wedge, the bottom of the trees and the shrubbery and a couple of shadows on the red wedge. And so there we go. That's the, This is... Um, the, a color wheel and I think it kind of shows some good interactions right so we have we have the house here in the background which is a cooler color but it even though it's roughly the same size as these birds it looks like it's further away naturally to us it's gonna look like it's further away the birds look like they're closer together so we kind of get that visual with this image and it's just a great way to kind of think about how all the colors are interacting because colors are constantly interacting with each other. And there's a lot of really cool things you can do if you're playing around with color theory. So, All right, so that was color theory. If you did like this video, please like and subscribe. And I will see you all next time. Take care.